Hi, good evening. This is Nikita, co-founder and CEO of Society for Space Education, Research and Development. SSCRD uh, comes with an initiative of Space Talk at SSCRD, wherein we bring in the professionals from various space backgrounds and we let them share the knowledge that they have with the people uh, around us. So, yeah, today we have uh, another amazing speaker with us. Uh, let me introduce the speaker of the day, Dr. Moriba Ja. Dr. Moriba is the uh, Director of Computational Astronautical Sciences and uh, Technologies, a group within the Auden Institute of Computational Engineering and Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Dr. Ja is also an engineer, an entrepreneur, more, more of it, he's a space environmentalist. He, he, he is uh, very passionate on with the problems that we have uh, in space, particularly the debris. So uh, he's been a speaker. He has been one of the you know, role model for many of them who is working on this problem. And anyone who has any questions related to space debris, they actually look into the works of Dr. Ja and try to learn how the how does the things work. So we're so happy to have him here. Uh, to add, he is also an associate editor of uh, Elziva Advances in Space Research Journal and serves on multiple committees uh, like IAA Space Debris, AIAA Astrodynamics, IAF Astrodynamics, and IAF Space Security. So uh, today he's come up with a topic that is so interesting for most of us, that's space safety, security, and sustainability, some salient challenges. So let's let's uh, listen from Dr. Moribaja, what are the problems and how did he work, how did he start and uh, what are his weaves on this uh, challenge that we have in this space. So let's welcome our speaker. Uh, hello sir, thank you so much for accepting our invitation on uh, joining uh, with us uh, on a space talk at SSCRD. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're yep. so delighted and all our students are so excited to hear from you. And uh, for the next few minutes, I'm not going to disturb you at all. I request you all to take us through the work that you've been doing, your personal journey, your personal interest on this topic. And uh, yeah, just, just enlighten us everything about this topic uh, that we have today. All right, so hopefully people can... Uh see my screen here yes sir we can see your screen all right so um let's just let's just get through this and this will uh have some technical issues as well um so yeah so uh before i even get into this i can just say that you know in, in my, my my background is in astrodynamics uh which is the science that studies motion of objects in space um I, I was really uh, interested in learning about orbits uh, from my youth when I used to be uh, a security uh, policeman in, in the military in the United States Air Force. I was enlisted when I, when I finished my, my uh, you know, high school. Um, and you know during my night watches, I used to look at the sky and it was, it was a very, very dark skies in, in the state of Montana when I was guarding nuclear missiles. And um, I would see dots of light go across the sky and they weren't, you know, it, they were moving too fast to be planes, but too slow to be, uh, you know, meteors. And, uh, uh, and I realized that these things were uh, objects that humans had put into orbit. So that really... Uh, kind of solidified my curiosity to understand things about uh, orbits and satellites. And when I left the military uh, after my, my four years of service, uh, I ended up going to uh, this university in, in Arizona, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University to study aerospace engineering. And uh, I met uh, a man there, Ron Madler, who uh, was a good mentor to me. And 
his background was also astrodynamics, and he had studied space debris when he was in graduate school at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And so, yeah, I kind of followed in his footsteps a bit, um, finishing my aerospace engineering degree at Embry-Riddle, and then I went to uh, University of Colorado uh, for graduate school to continue under the late George Bourne, who gave me a chance to, to be his, his student. Uh, and I learned about orbit determination and these sorts of things. And, you know, from, from my time at University of Colorado, I ended up going to uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where I was a spacecraft navigator for a variety of Mars missions. And um, sometime in 2006, I, uh, I left my job at NASA to move with my family to an island uh, called Maui in the Hawaiian Islands. And... Um, uh, my family very much liked a trip to Maui that we had made a couple years earlier. And anyway, on the island of Maui, the Air Force Research Laboratory, now Space Force, uh, has some telescopes that are used to track things uh, around Earth. And the interesting thing about uh, what I found out at that point in time is shifting from Mars to Earth is that there's this population of, of objects uh, that that humans created uh, that are orbiting the Earth, and this slide basically gets to that. You know, we the the U.S. Space Space Command uh, maintains a, a database, a catalog of about uh, you know twenty six thousand objects ranging in size from cell phone all the way to the space station, and and of these twenty six thousand objects, roughly about three thousand of these things are actively controlled satellites that serve a purpose and, and, and are working and, and delivering services and capabilities and everything else is garbage, which is amazing. So, so uh, you know, the, the ratio of, of garbage to things that work is, is, is huge. Uh, you know, 96% of, of human-made objects in space is pretty much trash. And so, um, you know, the plot on this slide on the upper left comes from uh, the Orbital Debris Program Office at Johnson Space Center in Houston, and it just kind of shows you this graph of, 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 of the population, but the top of the slide says assumed because, um, you know, we, we, we don't only worry about things we can track, there's a population of things that we can't track that we hypothesize exists uh, going all the way down to, to a millimeter uh, in size. And, and we believe the population going down to a mil millimeter is, is roughly around half a million objects. And, and so these millimeter size objects uh, can, can greatly disrupt services and capabilities of satellites just because of relative speeds. Uh, as everybody knows, a, a bullet is a very small thing, but uh, has a lot of kinetic energy, right? Is moving very quickly. Something small moving very quickly has a lot of kinetic energy. And so that is a recipe for disaster. Uh, if these pieces of, of paint and these sorts of things that are millimeter size, uh, you know, collide with working satellites. So we have to worry about these things. Um, this right here is just going to, uh, a, a movie made by AGI, gives you an idea from Sputnik uh, all the way to, to recent years of how the population uh, has been growing and the dots here are not to scale, they're just representative roughly of location. Um, so, so it just gives you an idea of the location of these things. And, uh, as, as, as human beings tend to do, we're very good at polluting. <laughs> we're very good at, at putting trash in different domains. And so it's not just the land and the seas and the atmosphere, uh, of earth that, uh, we've been polluting. We've also been doing this to near earth outer space, unfortunately. Um, let's see if we can get to the next slide here. So every once in a while... <coughs> two things collide with each other in space, and when, when two things collide, bad things can happen. So here's another movie from AGI. In 2009, uh, a dead Russian satellite, Cosmos, collided with a working satellite, Iridium, and um, bad things happened. And, and, and when these things collide, you can kind of get an idea of the debris created as a result of the collision, and you get many, many, many thousands of objects that now form part of the, 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 the pollution in near-Earth uh, outer space. Um, depending on the altitude where this happens, uh, some of these objects may be there pretty much uh, you know, for, for, for the foreseeable future. 
some some of these re-enter, but a lot of debris is created, and um, many of these pieces of debris are, are you know can't be tracked. Very difficult to be tracked. So um, anyway, it gives you an idea of how these things evolve over time, and 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 how it builds kind of this shell of 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 garbage that we have to find a way to navigate through. One of the things that I created at here at the University of Texas at Austin is this thing called Astrograph. It was initially funded by the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration and other entities have contributed to this. And anyways, it's the first kind of, uh, you know, crowdsourced, multi-source uh, space traffic monitoring system. If you Google it, you can look at it on your cell phone, that sort of thing. But basically, it combines multiple sources of information about stuff in space and represents it in a common framework. And um, again, the dots aren't to scale, but uh, people's opinions vary. Like, uh, you can go and check out different sources of information and you're going to see that all these sources don't necessarily agree with each other. Uh, we have big space traffic, um, planned space traffic uh, in the next few years. We have the Starlink satellites from SpaceX, OneWeb, uh, went bankrupt, but apparently just a couple days ago got, uh, got reacquired, I think. Uh, there's an Indian company and, and the, the, the UK government uh, both chipped in to acquire this, so, so OneWeb will still uh, be alive. Okay. And, um, and there's also Amazon, uh, which, which has this project, Kuiper. So lots of people are trying to launch lots of satellites in the next few years. This kind of gives you an idea of number of satellites as a function of orbit altitude. And the thing that should concern you here is that these circles aren't uh, completely separate from each other. There's some overlap, so that there's a sharing, there's a sharing of the orbital ecosystem that these people need to be able to do, and it, so it needs to be jointly managed by a group of people. It can't just be, uh, you know, single one single entity uh, trying to do this. So, so it just it raises some concerns that we need to be mindful of how to manage the traffic. Um, Basically, you know, near-Earth space is like the Wild West. It's poorly monitored. Uh, there's no global pool of shared observational data. Uh, there are little to no rules. About Even though nobody can claim ownership of near-Earth space, it's, it's uh, equivalent of squatters' rights in the sense that you know, physics tells us that, you know, two, two things can't occupy the same space at the same time or bad things happen, like I showed you before. So pretty much whoever gets there first uh, can basically say, listen, uh, nobody else can be around me because it's going to be a, a big risk. So, so the people that get there first, uh, you know, as with other areas of life, uh, stand to make the most money, right? Um, and we have technology that makes access to space easier and cheaper. So it's kind of like the equivalent of transcontinental railroad in the United States that connected the East Coast to the West Coast. And we need some norms of behavior that we can all agree on. Okay. Uh, one of the things that uh, I believe is a solution to this or a potential solution is looking at the voices of our indigenous people. And, uh, uh, you know, some indigenous people from India included that, uh, you know, there are pockets of these indigenous people that have learned how to be in balance with the ecosystem, how to make sure that you don't overfish or over, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, deforest and, and these sorts of things. And so there's some principles or tenets of this so-called traditional ecological knowledge that you can see here. And I kind of reworded some things so it's relevant to space. But the, yeah, the voices of our ancient people, uh, we should be listening to them to figure out how we should behave in the future. I mean, very common sense things like, you know, looking uh, at uh, relationships between things in a domain and, uh, again, coming up with norms of behavior that we can agree on that lead to sustainability and being very mindful of cultural uh, elements in the ecosystem and how to be respectful of these sorts of things, uh, how, to, how to share this common ecosystem, right? So, so traditional ecological knowledge has some principles that we can use. And, and here I have these kind of three, three main spheres that we need to focus, uh, you know, best practices that show, you know, there's evidence that these practices lead to sustainability, 
the knowledge that we gain, we should openly share that and empower others so that so so that everybody can behave responsibly, and which takes us to ethics and 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 again making sure that uh, we're very mindful and respectful of life in general. So this thing called space situational awareness, kind of what is this? Um, I'll just say that there are hazards in space that I spoke about when things might collide with each other, and we want to be very mindful of. And, and you know, have an ability to predict when this might happen. Warn people of of some danger and of, of these hazards on orbit. But at the same time, there's also uh, you know malintent. You know, uh, just just like in other domains, space is no different. I mean, any domain of human activity suffers from from nefarious behavior. Uh, so to think that space is nothing but great people that love each other and nobody's going to do harm is naive. And so we have to have a way to monitor people's behavior, to hold people accountable for that, uh, so that we can basically try to dissuade or deter people from, from acting uh, negatively or intentionally harmfully against other people. So we need. So in order to get to you know, safety, security, and sustainability, what we really need is transparency. Uh, how, how, how do we know where everything's at, who owns it, what this thing uh you know, can do, you know, predictability, where are these things going to be, how are they going to behave, even things that are controlled by people, given, given a common scenario, how will these people uh, choose to act in that scenario, so that there's culture uh, that's involved in that, you know, <clears throat> people, from, people from the Indian Space Research Organization, having grown up with the customs and traditions in India, in a given scenario, might take some actions that are different than people that were born and raised in the United States or born and raised in China. So our behavior is, is, is you know, I guess tainted through the lens of where we were born and what we were raised with in customs. So to think that everybody behaves the same in space is ridiculous. So we have to take, uh, you know, culture into account as well. I would say some essential ingredients for success. We need we need independent monitoring of the domain. Um, you know, people have been conducting anti-satellite tests. The U.S. has done that. China's done that. Russia's done that. And you know, India's done that very recently, right? And so we want to. Uh, we don't want people to be destroying objects in space that lead to the creation of more garbage as this demonstration of, of, of this military might to be able to destroy a satellite. That's crazy. That's ridiculous. It's irresponsible. We should, we should not do that ever again. And so, uh, but in order to, to put pressure on people to stop doing that, we need evidence to be independently corroborated and we need evidence to be public. We need to bring this to the public square. So, we need an independent body or mechanism to, to monitor space. We need to come up with sustainability metrics, agree that space near Earth, you know, out, all of outer space may be infinite, but near Earth space is finite. It's a finite resource. We don't put satellites just anywhere. We put them in very specific locations, orbital zip codes or neighborhoods or highways. These highways are becoming more crowded because most of the stuff on the orbital highways doesn't come back. And so we need to start taking metrics from sustainability in other domains, again, oceans, maritime, on, on the land, things like environmental protection, that needs to be extended, you know, beyond oceans, atmospheres, and climates, and it now needs to encompass, you know, a couple tens of thousands of kilometers of altitude above the Earth's surface. These things are connected, and I, and I, and I intend to demonstrate uh, through my work eventually uh, the level of connectedness of these things. But we need to develop a space traffic footprint, kind of like a carbon footprint analog. We need, a, we need to be able to quantify the capacity, the carrying capacity of any orbit for safe and sustainable uh, operations and these sorts of things. And the World Economic Forum is developing a space sustainability rating, and I'm part of that team with MIT, Bryce Technologies, and uh, folks at the European Space Agency. All right, so you've heard about a few challenges going through here. So objects in space... Uh, so what motivates the motion of these things? Uh, there's this thing called gravity. Uh, so, so that's a dominant uh, 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 source of acceleration. And not just gravity of the Earth, but the moon and the sun. Uh, we have 
uh, photons, energy from the sun interacting with, with, with space object surfaces. It heats them up. It, it exchanges momentum, pushes these things. So that's that thermal forcing. Uh, we have radiation from the Earth, uh, thermal radiation from the Earth, and the reflectance of these photons from the Earth onto the satellite. And also, if the satellite's communicating with an antenna, uh, you know, Newton's third law sort of thing means that there's some antenna recoil depending on the size of the antenna. The Earth is not perfectly round. It's definitely not, not flat. So for you people that think Earth is flat, um, I, I can't even begin to have that conversation with you. But just realize that the Earth is not perfectly spherical, and so we have tidal effects. We have relativistic effects as well. So it's challenging. The space environment has an effect and impact on how objects behave. We don't fully understand that, so there's some science that needs to be done there. Um, and one of the reasons is that in this idea of space situational awareness, if we have an anomaly for a satellite, we don't always know what caused the anomaly. So, so the, the unfortunate thing is usually many hypotheses explain the same evidence. So satellite malfunctions, why did that happen? Is it because the sun had a hiccup of energy? Is it because some micrometeoroid hit me? Was it a speck of paint from something that flew off and hit me? Did somebody, uh, when I wasn't looking, do something evil to my satellite? So all these possible hypotheses tend to explain the same evidence, and that's part of the problem. So we need to bring more information, more evidence to try to rule out hypotheses so that we can, uh, you know, get to one-to-one one -one causal relationships is what we want. Uh, our community, like other communities, suffers from confirmation bias, which is very unfortunate because once we have uh, beliefs about things in space, we tend to hold very tightly to these beliefs and we tend to disregard new evidence, especially evidence that might suggest that our beliefs are wrong. So we have to be a bit loose with that. We have to challenge ourselves and uh, be open to the possibility that our, that our beliefs need to change. Uh, so, so that's part of uh, the work that we do. And one of the things that kind of underscores that and the need to really exchange information with each other is because nobody has the truth. Nobody knows the truth. Uh, you can have, you know, there's no sensor that's a truth sensor. Um, even though a true thing may be the input to the sensor, all sensors are biased. All sensors suffer from noise. Uh, so, 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 there's, so you don't get the truth out of any sensor. Uh, human or, or 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 otherwise, and so by combining, you know, these sources of information, we can get to a more complete understanding of the truth, but never achieve the exact truth. Um, so here's here's an example of of what the U.S. Uh, you know Department of Defense might say is a true 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 uh, representation of space traffic, but if you ask the Russians, that's what the Russians believe. So these things don't look exactly alike. And so that's part of what I'm trying to say. Uh, even opinions about where something is located in space, here's one object uh, with four different opinions. So which one's right? Which ones are wrong? This is some of the, of, of the work that we have to reconcile this. We also have different information categories. Uh, you know, some information to some people might be truth, to others it might be uh, false, there's disinformation, misinformation, so we need to keep track of all these things. And um, one of the issues that we have is a, an inability to uniquely identify objects in space. That's very difficult because I told you there's like you know 26,000 objects, only 3,000 work, everything else is garbage. The garbage doesn't report its identity, so, so how do you figure that out? Um, this is an example of just detections over a single night where all the detections are dots, the black dots are things that we detected and we've identified, uh, or we believe we know the identity and everything else is unknown. So there, it's a problem. Uh, we, we, detecting is, is, is not sufficient. We need to be able to, to track things. So another way to say that is if you collect data from, say, a telescope at three different times and you have different numbers of objects in there, how do you know that you're, you've seen the same object time and time again? How do you know the identity of object one, two, three? That's part of the, the issue that we need to solve. So a quick example of what we've done there, just to wrap things up, is um, we try to take advantage of light that's being scattered off of the surface of objects. So sunlight interacts with these photons, interact with objects and surfaces. Uh, the, the, the object reflects the light 
towards some telescope on the ground or maybe in space. We call that light curves or, or, or photometric data. And so we try to be good interpreters of what the light uh, are trying to tell us. Here's an example of a satellite called Topex. Uh, we've, this is real data. We've collected the light off of this object many times, so we kind of understand it. But on the right, you kind of see the return of, of photons that have been scattered off of this stuff. And you see that it's not uniform. Like you see different spikes and these sorts of things. And so different surfaces of the object um, reflect differently because they're made out of different materials and they have different properties and that sort of stuff. So we try to exploit that. And so this just gives you an idea of the types of reflection uh, that we can try to get uh, out of this both specular and diffuse uh, uh, reflections of photons. And the cool thing is once we, once we uh, s get the, the, that light that's being reflected, we can imagine a unit sphere around the object. We, 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 we hold the body frame fixed and then we see where, where, where from the body did photons leave and then we build a heat map on a sphere. We unravel that on a two-dimensional two multi-body projection. And so what you see on the right is a result of that, of Topex. It's real data. The parts that have no information are the parts of the spacecraft we did not see. But you can see that, that we have some interesting features in here, and we call this a quanta photogram. And the cool thing is you can see from two different nights that these things are not identical, but they're very similar. So, so it's almost like we're, what we're doing is we're fingerprinting objects. We're collecting uniquely identifiable features on the objects to use as a fingerprint, as an identification mechanism for these objects in space through remote sensing. So anyway, there you go. I just want to wrap up and just say uh, I know that that was quick. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of questions, but the beliefs and confirmation bias, I like this quote from Bertrand Russell, which says, the problem of the world is that the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of doubt. So be, be doubtful. And let me, let me, let me, uh, let's see, stop sharing. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's always that we know that, yes, uh, space debris is a major challenge we have, but then how exactly is being um, identified and what is the quantity or how does it affect or how do we even observe them? How do we try to look at them? Uh, all these details were given by you uh, during this uh, presentation that you gave and it was really, really amazing. And I, and I, I'm sure that the students and the audience who are watching this would have really uh, got an idea of what exactly are the challenges of uh, space debris and yeah and space environment and everything. Yeah, so all the audience, you know, in case if you have any questions, uh, do comment there. If you're on YouTube, just put a comment there. If you're on Facebook, uh, do comment there. So we pick up the questions from there and we ask our speaker of the day. Meanwhile, I also uh, have a few questions already. So let me take those questions, uh, sir. Um, the qu first question goes uh, like this. Uh, you know, uh, do you think the the major threat is is uh, you know? Or let me let me tell you the question which is sent by Chirantan. Uh, what do you think is a major threat and should be tackled? Uh, for removing them, is it the smaller debris or the larger ones? Yeah, so I'll, I'll say um, two things. One, uh, certainly the the large the larger pieces. We know that the larger pieces are um, are big threats because uh, or hazards because these things can blow up or collide and become smaller pieces. So we should definitely we know we should remove the largest pieces because that's the where where most of the mass is located. And, and those things uh, can become smaller pieces. So we know that. But at the same time, we shouldn't neglect the small pieces. I'd say that there's probably, it's probably not useful to try to remove the small pieces, um, but we need to be able to know, you know, how many of these roughly exist in which orbital neighborhoods or, or, or uh, uh, highways so that when we build satellites, we can build them to shield to shield against this as much as possible. So it's like almost trying to inform ourselves what kind of body armor 
do satellites need in specific regions to protect them from uh, any sort of, of detrimental effects from collisions with the smaller pieces? Great. Uh, again, it's really nice to know the importance of both kind of debris and what is really important for us. So since you've been working in this uh, field from a very long time, I'm pretty sure you must have come across many companies who are working on how to clear them. Like you said, how to identify them, what could be done. But if you can also share some insights on if there are any engineers around, if there are any scientists around or anyone who's working on uh, how exactly do we kind of uh, clear these debris in the space? What are the technologies that uh, people are, you know, coming up with? And what do you think would be uh, the most ideal one wherein it works to clear the space debris? Uh, so I, I would say that there's no uh, demonstrated technique that works well on everything and that sort of stuff. I know that. Uh, on YouTube, you can find videos of uh, uh, the folks at Surrey. They they demonstrated like a harpoon and, and a net on orbit. Um, you know, these things work for some things. They don't work for everything, clearly. Um, you have companies like Astroscale. Their business model is to be, you know, space sweepers and that sort of thing. Uh, you have some startups that are looking at this sort of stuff as well, Luxembourg and other places. And you have, uh, you know, Clear Space, which is a mission funded by... Uh, Europe that will that in 2025 will go and and remove uh, a larger piece of debris this uh, Vespa payload adapter uh, and clear space is being run out of uh, 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 folks at EPFL in Lausanne in Switzerland so you have people looking at this the the biggest problem with space garbage uh, is is mitigation and and that people people, most people are not compliant with the guidelines of how to mitigate debris. That's the biggest problem. Once you can solve that and get people to comply more, then, uh, you know, th this shouldn't be looked at as an or. It's not cleaning debris or mitigating. It has to be and. So we need to, we need to be more of and people instead of or people. We need to do the compliance with debris mitigation and we need to clean some, some, some of it. At some point, um, you know, we, we also need to realize that we have to be comfortable enough to live within our own filth. And what I mean by that is that, you know, uh, unfortunately, our bath water will never be completely clean. There's no way to clean all the debris. That will never happen. So, so it's impossible. It's economically unfeasible. Like, there's no way that's going to happen. So there is this filth that, that we, we're now held hostage to. We need to understand how do we live and thrive in this background filth in outer space. Some things can be clean, but most of it will not be. Um, but we should prevent further creation of, 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 of debris. Got it, sir. Got it, uh, again, uh, very well explained. Um, I have another interesting question from our team, in fact. Uh, the question goes like this. How do you think companies like OneWeb and Starlink want to provide satellite-based internet with tens and thousands of satellites orbiting in low Earth orbit would affect the future of space travel? Like considering that many satellites and probability of them creating debris sometime later in the future would, you know, just, just what's, what's your thought on this? So I have a, I have a few thoughts. Um, the first, the first thing that, that, that bothers me is that the discussion about what to do in space and how to behave is not inclusive. It's not an inclusive conversation. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, these companies, they, 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 they follow a legal process. Inclusivity is not built into the legal process, meaning, you know, if I'm Acme Incorporated and I want to put 10,000 satellites up there, there's a process that I follow to get licensing and all these other things. But in that process, I'm not be I'm not uh, required to talk to people in rural communities to ask them their opinion about having more things in the sky and how they might feel about that. Um, I'm not required to, to talk to people of different sectors um, that maybe not uh, immediately uh, are space people. You know. Uh, people in agriculture and others about, you know, how they feel that might, you know, what are they willing to give up? Like if, if I give them this technology for internet, but at the same time, 
um, I'm polluting the sky with more traffic and that sort of stuff. You know, people have not been engaged into that conversation. But again, it's not been part of the legal process, right? So I think the thing that I want to motivate is, you know, you, we shouldn't just do things because it's legal. There should be, uh, we should be responsible to try to be good stewards and good custodians of the environment and realize that the conversation needs to expand beyond people that are just space nerds and that sort of thing. Um, so I think, I think, I think for one, there's that. Two, uh, the number of objects in and of itself isn't so much the problem as it is knowing where these things are going to be, openly communicating as much as possible about this stuff. So the transparency and the predictability piece is really key. And so you can have, look, I mean, if we look at air traffic, um, you know, there's some airports, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to put, you know, New Delhi and, and, and Mumbai uh, included, right? Bangalore, lots of traffic coming in. Um, given today's technology, that traffic can be handled. If you look 60 years ago or more, uh, there's no way that these airports could sustain the current traffic because you, you, for a variety of reasons. So, <clears throat> you know, the number of objects that can be managed has increased greatly in air traffic because of technology, because of the transparency and the predictability and the accountability. So these things have to be mapped to near Earth space. And if we do that, then we can tolerate larger numbers of objects, but there needs to be a holistic mechanism to manage uh, that orbital ecosystem. Got it uh, again. Uh, yeah. So, so I have uh, one question which connects to this. Now, let's say uh, we did hear about the collisions and the debris that it would create. I want to know uh, your perspective on the policy aspects. Like, let's say uh, there are two satellites going around and then they kind of collide and create the debris. How is policy, um, you know, acting on this particular issue? Who is responsible for what? And what are the usual things that happen after the collisions? Like, what will the companies have to bear? Yeah, so so what you ask is very interesting. There's no, uh, you know, may, maybe you have the, the international courts in The Hague uh, uh, that might uh, be, be resourced to try to look at something like that. But... Uh, you know, in the collision that happened between Iridium and Cosmos, nobody went to jail over that. Nobody was was given this burden of 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 uh, culpability of creating the debris. None of none of that got kind of um, you know persecuted or prosecuted or whatever. So, and that was I think a missed opportunity to to put some precedence. So I think in general, you know, there's no there's no third party liability uh, on orbit right now. Space insurance companies don't don't have on orbit uh, insurance policies that you know we need to move in that direction. So I think we need to put some science that allows insurance companies to charge premiums for this stuff because that helps regulate things a bit. Um, we do have the Outer Space Treaty, and that 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 is legally binding, and over a hundred uh, countries have ratified that from like 1967. But these terms are very loosely interpreted. Uh, you know, for, for instance, Article 6 of Outer Space Treaty says the words that, uh, you know, states are responsible, responsible for uh, continuing supervision of, of, of non-government actors in space. When I interpret that, to me, continuing supervision means that they always know what's happening. Other people don't interpret it that way. But I can tell you that nobody knows everything that's happening. That's part of the problem. And it's back to we need ways to crowdsource and, and, and independently monitor uh, space actors so that we can build evidence that we can build that we can then take to the public square and and so people are aware of what's happening and how people are behaving and what the consequences are intentional consequences and unintended consequences of our actions in space because that's the only way that we're going to get to enforcement like what I tell people is you can't enforce what you don't know and you don't know what you don't measure so it all boils down to measurements Got it. Got it. So we have one of the question. In fact, two questions I would like to combine and ask. Uh, so this question is from uh, one of our uh, student, uh, Deepti Narasimhan. Uh, so she asks that, uh, you know, 
uh, how do you tackle time lag in having a set of data being processed in real time when uh, when it would move significantly by the time that information was processed it's regarding the uh, astia graph that that's been you know found by you this is a question based on that yeah so so now we're not here uh near real time tracking and and yeah the time lag is is very very good. In fact, one of the areas of research is, is um, you know, how do we incorporate lagged measurements or lagged observations without having to reprocess everything again? That that is an area of research that we're looking at. So, so most of what we try to do is, as we get data, we try to do orbit determination when we get sensor measurements, and then basically what you see in astrograph is is predictions. So it's not near real time tracking. It's mostly pre predictive uh, uh, kind of things. And hopefully, if, if you're getting the right amount of measurements, your predictions can be within quantifiable uh, precision, where, where the precision hopefully it, it get, gets better and better uh, uh, as, as you incorporate more sources of information. Got it. And in fact, my next question was that, and you try to answer within this question. So really nice to know. Uh, there are a set of students and interns who are working along with us, sir, and they have taken uh, the mitigation of orbital debris is one of the challenge, and they're working on that. Now, what is that you would like to recommend to them? What is that they should concentrate? And, and all these are uh, undergrad students, and they want to see what they could do. So what would you like to suggest students like them and all other students around if they think this is a problem? What would you like to suggest them how to go with this problem? So I, I think the biggest problem is the lack of compliance with debris mitigation. So I would say focus on ways to measure compliance or lack of compliance uh, of all people acting in space and make that publicly knowable. Got it. Got it. So are there any, uh, you know, work that's happening uh, in CAST related to this particular? So since you have the kind of uh, data that you have with all the debris that are there, are there any technologies that the CAST is coming up to solve this problem to remove the debris or anything? So we're not, we're not focused. On the, we're focused on the measurements part. So we're trying to measure everything as much as possible, predict how things are going to behave, characterize the objects. Uh, and so by, by doing that, um, then we can also start evaluating compliance and non-compliance with the debris mitigation. And for people that want to do the debris removal, we're trying to provide some information that might be helpful. For instance, with the clear space folks out at Switzerland, EPFL, Muriel Richards, we, we have already started collaborating with them and taking observations of the VESPA payload adapter. And so our, our contribution is going to be to, to really rigorously and comprehensively characterize that object in terms of its size, shape, material properties, all that, so that when they go to meet this thing, they have a very good idea uh, of, of, of how to take it and, and all these things to minimize any sort of uh, hazards and whatnot. Got it. Got it. I, I really understood your concentration is something on, uh, you know, uh, searching and, and kind of looking for more data on debris. But then you're you're very happy in helping others who who would like to work on the technology to remove the debris. So that's amazing. And uh, for sure, uh, many uh, I mean, what we aim is, uh, of course, when we have the data, we want people to come up uh, with an innovative idea to come and solve. So what do you think is a problem that there is not even one idea or one technology that has proved to not remove the debris? Well, what the would thing, be the problem? Well, the thing is, we, we uh, <laughs> right now, um, most of the people that model the population assume that everything is a sphere. So, 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 so every object orbiting the Earth is, 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 is spher spherical. It's like a cannonball. And so, and we know that um, there are very few spherical objects up there. Um, and so that's part of why, why we're in the business, you know, my group is in the business of characterizing the objects in terms of size, shape, material properties, because different techniques, you're not going to find a debris removal technique that's going to work for everything because you have things that are the size of a school bus, you have CubeSats, so you have different types of, of classes of objects. 
there right now there is no scientific taxonomy uh, for for human made objects in space. It does not exist. Uh, that is um, that's that's amazing to me that you know after so many years we don't have something like that. If you go to you know some website to see oh what are the type of classes of objects? It's like oh well it's satellite, rocket body, or debris. There's these three categories, but each the 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 differences between objects and each can be hu hugely uh, different. So one of the things that we're working on uh, is to try to develop the scientific taxonomy of human-made objects in space, so that we can have these different classes and species. And based on these, then I think it makes sense to say, okay, for this type of object, these are the removal techniques that work. For these types of objects, these are. Because you're not going to find, it's not a Lord of the Rings, one ring to rule them all kind of method that's going to work here. Got it, got it. Uh, this is one of the question, something apart from the topic that we are talking, but yeah, one of our uh, intern and student, Maithili Patak, uh, has a question. You wrote an article about NASA's Artemis Accords. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, would you like to answer? Yeah, I mean, so... You know, NASA is trying to send people to the moon by 2024. This is this Artemis uh, kind of program, but clearly interested in even going to Mars at some point. And, you know, there's a set of uh, these accords are, are kind of like things that NASA wants uh, partners from other countries to, to subscribe to, almost like some sort of code of conduct and these sorts of things, right? Debris mitigation is one of them. Uh, respecting cultural heritage, like the Apollo uh, program related things. So, so it just kind of, interestingly enough, it reminds me a lot of this traditional ecological knowledge that I brought up earlier in my talk, that, um, you know, one person's trash is, is another person's treasure. Uh, you know, when you look at Mars, I would say we've already started polluting the surface of Mars, right? I mean, um, it's, it's very sad to me in the things if you walk on the surface of Mars, you're going to see the, uh, you know, pieces of back shell from heat shields. You're going to see, you know, parachutes uh, uh, that are laying across the Martian uh, soil and, and, and these sorts of things. This is trash. Um, but, you know, the country that put it there, they're going to call it a monument. Oh, this is, you know, I sent this rover and it died. So now this is a monument or this is a whatever. But to other people, it's garbage. So, um you know, it's very nuanced. We need to be very uh, kind of careful about how we, we think about these things. And it just shows that we don't uh, we don't consider these things all the same. But yeah, the, the Artemis Accords are these kind of sets of things that NASA wants other countries to subscribe to. But but the, the, uh, the premise of the article is that while these things are nice and you can find these things in like United Nations uh, Committee Peaceful on Uses of Outer Space, those documents and that sort of stuff, it's back to you can't you can't enforce or manage what you don't know and you don't know what you don't measure. So so how 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 would anybody know after after all these countries signed the Artemis Accords, how do you know who's following them and who doesn't? Like if one of them signs and then doesn't do it, how would you know? What are the repercussions? What are the uh uh right? It's like what are the consequences for signing that and then not doing it? Um so th this is really the, at the heart of things. It's it's not enough just to have some nice words, but but you have to have some meat behind it. And you have to have a way to kind of make people know, uh, you know, when when these things are being followed and when when they're not being followed. Great. Um, again, uh, I would like to thank you uh, for answering all the you know uh, questions that we had, uh, and I and I hope that answers all of our all of our audience question. So, uh, so I I want to kind of uh, wrap it up by asking a question: What is that final message that you would like to give the young people out there, the bright minds and the space enthusiasts? What is that? the personal message that you have for them. So my message is um, space is not the special thing. Uh, space is just an extension of human activity. Um, so, 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 so don't, don't, don't swallow this pill of space is just for people with PhDs. Space is just for billionaires. No space is for everybody. And, you know, don't accept people behaving in space in a way that 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 you don't agree with without you having a voice so so feel empowered because space is 
uh, common heritage of, 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 of all of us, we should look at space instead of typical, uh, you know, Western society tends to focus on ownership. I own this, I own that. Life is about collecting and owning things. Space is not that. Space is, is, is a common resource and think of it as stewardship, as custodianship versus ownership. And, and how, how do we become good stewards? Um, I, want, I want you to realize that knowledge is something that, that everybody should have. Everybody should, should have access to that. Uh, and, I'd li- and, and I want you to think about that knowledge needs to be democratized and, and not just held by certain people. Um, and, and that uh, basically everything is connected. You know, the things that affects oceans, atmospheres, and climates, there's stuff that will affect space. It's, it's all one, one fabric. And so we need to think about these things. When, when we have, you know, storms in Africa and the Sahara, the dust storms now have affected parts of the United States. We're, it's one globe. We're one humanity. And that we're much more similar than we are different. You know, all the fights that you see around the globe focuses on these differences. But I can tell you genetically... We're, we're, we're less than a percent different from each other. So don't let the differences drive uh, all this separatist kind of stuff. Realize that we're more similar than we are different. Sir, are you here? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes, very well. Thank you so much, uh, sir. Um, and uh, so, Sujay, are we, are we still on, right? Hello? So I, I can hear you. Okay, great, great. So, uh, yeah, it's a personal uh, message that I have uh, is thank you so much for accepting our request and uh, joining us on this. Um, it's, it's a very early morning for you, but still you agreed to join us on our program and you took us through a very wonderful journey about space debris and everything. Uh, I would like to thank you on behalf of our team, the audience and everyone. Thank you so much. And I also wish you um, the happy fourth of July. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Cheers. Thank you, sir.